it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. We opened a doorway to hell. 10.48pm. Yeah, you ready? Jeffrey Morgan read the text several times before starting to type his response and stopping. No, he wasn't ready. He wouldn't be ready even if he lived to be a thousand. But he couldn't chicken out. Yeah, he typed and hit send. Sighing, Jeff got up and grabbed his shoes from the spot by the closet door. He was already dressed in a pair of black sweatpants and a white t-shirt. Navigating by moonlight, he grabbed his black hoodie from the desk under the window and slipped it on. He checked his phone, so it was 10.55, and briefly considered texting Andrew back and telling him he couldn't make it. Something told him, though, that they would see through his excuse. This is your damn chance, Morgan, Jeff thought. Outside, the old oak tree dominating the backyard swayed in the cold autumn wind. Don't blow it. The thought of losing the only chance he'd had to make friends since coming to Western Port scared him shitless. He thought back to all the times he'd eaten lunch by himself that fall and shuddered. When he and his family moved from Hagerstown in June, his father told him, Ah, you all make friends. Well, Jeff never made friends easily to begin with. On top of that, he was walking into a school where everyone knew everyone and had since elementary school. He was an outsider in Hagerstown, but that was okay. There were others. Here, he didn't have Johnny or Tim. Didn't have the magic. The Gathering Gang. Well, he didn't have anyone. He was totally and utterly alone. He was shocked then when Andrew Cooper sat with him at lunch last Monday. Tall and thin with glasses, Andrew wasn't popular by jock or cheerleader standards, but he had a lot of friends and everyone seemed to like him. Yeah, I saw your deck, Andrew said, nodding to the deck of magic cards sitting by Jeff's tray. During lunch, he took them out and played against himself. Some of the other kids snickered as they passed by, and though he didn't have proof, he thought they were laughing at him. Yeah, Jeff had replied. I used to play a lot. I used to be big into magic, Andrew said, opening up his milk carton and taking a swig. But that's, like, well, sixth grade stuff. Jeff felt a flush of humiliation. Sensing his faux pas, Andrew hastened to add, Well, I mean, compared to what I play now. Um, what's that? Jeff asked. Devil Spawn. Before the bell, Andrew managed to explain the basics of Devil Spawn. Each player typically between 3 and 13, played as either a demon or a lightbringer. Lightbringer were enemies of the demons, sort of like Van Helsing to Dracula. The board was painted to resemble a fantasy world, with rivers, oceans, dense forests and deserts. The goal, for the demons, was to bring hell on Earth. For the lightbringers, it was to prevent hell on Earth. Simple, Jeff thought, but Andrew and his coven upped the ante by playing a live-action roleplay version in the woods north of town. They would meet in Andrew's basement on Monday evening, all 13 of them, excluding Andrew, and make plans for that week's game. On Friday, they would steal out of their houses close to midnight and play the game, sometimes staying out until sunrise. Andrew told him later, as he walked home from school, that he was planning a special game. Well, I've been reading a lot about Satanism, he said. I found this book in the library that says you can summon him and use his power. I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm going to try. Why? Jeff asked. They're on his street now, a narrow, tranquil lane flanked by big houses and shady trees. A few other kids walked along the sidewalk on the other side of the road, lost in their cell phones. Because well, I'm sick of being a no one, that's why. Well, Jeff opened his mouth, but closed it again. He was afraid he'd say the wrong thing and offend Andrew. I want to be powerful, the older boy went on. I want people to listen to what I say. Well, Jeff didn't know how to respond, so he said nothing. I can't do it without 13 apostles, though. Jeff looked at him. Robbie Horner moved away two weeks ago. I need someone else, and you seem pretty cool. Later, in his room, the lights off and his hands laced behind his head, Jeff pondered Andrew's invitation. He was elated to be part of something, 
but he had the nagging feeling that Andrew was just using him. Regardless, by the time midnight rolled around, his mind was made up. He would join the coven. They met that Wednesday night at Andrew's. Andrew introduced himself around, but even now Jeff couldn't remember all the names. There was Stephen Hunter, Simon Jamieson, Sean Johnson, and Kayla Winston. Well, he remembered her. A tall girl with shoulder-length black hair and hazel eyes, Kayla Winston lived in McCool, the town next over. She was 15, a year older than Jeff, and wore black eyeshadow and bright red lipstick. Sitting around the table with the others that night, Jeff found himself repeatedly stealing glances at her, his eyes lingering on her smooth, graceful throat and the soft curve of her face. She caught him several times and smiled. Next Friday, Andrew said. We'll do it next Friday. To Jeff's surprise, the others were as enthusiastic about raising the devil as Andrew. They talked of revenge and domination the way other kids talked about football or video games. Oh, did they really think Andrew could summon the devil? Did they really think they could bring forth the Prince of Darkness and use his powers? <laughs> that was crazy. Still, Jeff found himself wandering. Here, alone, the idea was madness. But in Andrew's awesome presence, it seemed true. He could call on Satan. He could use his power. Oh, he's really smart, Caleb said. If anyone can do it, it's him. It was Saturday afternoon. Jeff was reading a Terry Pratchett novel in his room when his mother poked her head in. There's a girl at the door looking for you. And she winked, and Jeff's cheeks blushed. When he found Kayla Winston standing on the doorstep dressed in jeans and a black t-shirt, he was shocked but also pleased. Hi, she chirped. Well, uh, hi, Jeff responded, hating the stupid sound of his voice. Want to hang out? <laughs> sure. Fifteen minutes later, they were walking south along the street. It was a mild day and sunshine filtered through the treetops. Well, I figured if you're going to be in our coven, I should get to know you better. After all, we're like brother and sister now. Yeah? Yeah, she said. Andrew says we're a family. Us against the world, you know. Well, I guess. South of town, Kayla led him onto a path disappearing into the woods. So, um, what are your parents like? She asked. The trail ran straight and true for several yards before bending. Through the trees ahead, all yellow and red, he could see the Potomac. I don't know, he shrugged. Cool, I guess. They don't hit you? No. She looked at him genuinely surprised. <sighs> Must be nice. Uh, do your parents hit you? Sometimes. Eventually the path led to a tall barren hill. Standing on it, Jeff had a sweeping view of the fiery autumn treetops stretching toward town. The only signs of mankind were a church steeple a blue water tower, and the sewage treatment plant, the latter a big, boxy brown building. Oh, it's beautiful, she said. Jeff swallowed. He wanted to tell her that she was beautiful, wanted to kiss her, but he was afraid, afraid that he would creep her out and they couldn't be friends anymore. Instead, he muttered, Yeah. Presently, he shook his head and turned from the window. The old cemetery, Andrew had said on Monday. They were in the cafeteria occupying most of a large table. We can do it there. Jeff felt strange being with such a large group. He was used to being by himself. Oh, it's out of the way, Stephen Hunter said. Not many people go there. Some do, Simon Jameson pointed out. There's a caretaker, right? Andrew flapped one hand. Oh, he only goes out there to cut the grass. We'll be fine, right, Jeff? Jeff, hearing his name, looked left and right. They were all watching him, their eyes boring into him. His face flushed and he licked his lips. Yeah, sure, he said. It was settled. They'd meet in the old cemetery off Ridge Road, overlooking the Potomac. Now, at his bedroom door, Jeff listened when he didn't hear anything, he slipped out into the hall and pulled it softly shut behind him. The hall was pitch black, and he had to wait a moment for his eyes to adjust. When they did, he crept to the top of the stairs and stopped to listen again. 
His parents' door was closed, but even so he could hear his father snoring. The snoring would hide any sounds he made, or so he hoped. His father could sleep through Judgment Day, but his mother would wake at the drop of a hat, if she heard anything out of the ordinary. Swallowing, his heart racing, Jeff started down the stairs, being careful to avoid the third one down, since it creaked. Halfway, he paused and listened. Nothing. At the bottom, he went to the front door and unlocked it. The sound of the tumblers was deafening in the silence, and he winced, certain that his parents would wake. For several stomach-churning minutes, he listened, and when he heard nothing, he slipped out, shut the door behind him, and locked it. The night was clear and cold. A biting wind swept up the street, stirring the trees and pushing dead leaves along the pavement. <laughs> Taking a deep breath, he tumbled down the stairs and followed the flagstone path to the sidewalk. He glanced left and right, saw no one, and crossed the street. From his house, Jeff followed Pine Street North, through a neighbourhood crammed with houses smaller and grimier than those on his street. At the intersection of Pine and Hill Avenue, he turned left and passed the elementary school. Home with the Bobcats! Hill Ave meets Main Street just south of the Union Inn. Shuttered storefronts glinted in the light of the moon. To the south, a car turned onto Driscoll Street its taillights glowing red, and for a second Jeff had a bone-chilling thought. What if it was his father out looking for him? He checked his phone. 11.14. He'd been gone almost 15 minutes. Plenty of time for his parents to wake up, discover his bed empty, and come looking for him. Flashing to the dreadful right ahead, he thought that maybe being dragged home by his ear wasn't such a bad thing. Shaking his head, he started north. A half mile from the town limits, the buildings lining the street fell away and were replaced by forest. At the clapboard sign reading, Welcome to Westernport. MD's nicest town. Main turns into Route 228, which winds 20 miles through the forest before reaching Kitzmiller. For the first 10 miles, it matches the Potomac Bend for Bend. Jeff walked along the gravel shoulder overlooking the river below, its inky surface dappled lunar white. The wind blew harder outside town, and Jeff shivered despite his hoodie. Two miles past the edge of town, Jeff left the main highway in favour of a dirt road nearly hidden by foliage. Andrew had pointed it out on a topography map on Thursday night. It's called Fried Mead Ridge Road. The cemetery's in a clearing at the very end of it. Jeff couldn't remember if it was one mile or two. The road ran fairly straight at first, before bending to the right and then beginning to climb into the hills. Moonlight filtered through the trembling treetops, and the only sound he could hear was the forlorn hooting of an owl somewhere in the distance. Shivering, he licked his lips and walked as quickly as he could without breaking into a run. He tried not to imagine what might be hiding in the forest, watching waiting to stumble out with his arms raised and his mouth open. He remembered a movie he saw once as a kid where a woman opened a door and this thing was lying on a bed, its skin sallow and its hair red. It giggled and said something about coming back, presumably from the dead. Oh, stop it. Please, stop it. After what seemed like an eternity, he came to the end of the forest. The road wound left and passed clear of the cemetery. From here it looked sinister, its iron gate and slanted stones reminding him of something from a Lovecraft story. He could imagine some great entity living beneath the soil, waiting to strike. Oh, shut up! Shaking his head, Jeff started across the lumpy field skirting the graveyard. At the gate he paused and swept the graveyard with his gaze, hoping to see Andrew and the others. He didn't. What if it was a prank? What if they'd lured him out here just to laugh at him? Pushing these thoughts aside, Jeff went into the cemetery. Uh, hello? He called, his voice refusing to echo. Over here. Jeff looked to his left. Someone was sitting on a tomb five feet high. As he drew closer, he saw it was Andrew. Ah, great. Now we can start, Andrew said, shoving off the tomb. The others were arranged in a rough circle beyond the slab. They looked up and muttered their greetings. Hey, 
Glad you made it, Preppy, Kayla Winston said with a wink. Preppy? Did she think he was a prep? While the others got to their feet, Andrew sparked a lighter and touched it to a pile of wood in the center of the circle. Jeff hadn't noticed it when he'd walked up. Tonight, we call forth the powers of Satan, Andrew said and backed away from the rising flames. Feeble orange light flickered across the night. Jeff, stand next to Kayla. Steve, stand next to Mike and hold hands. Feeling slightly stupid and very nervous, Jeff walked over to Kayla and stood next to her. Her hand crept into his and he felt a rush of warmth. Well, that warmth dimmed when Luke Johnson took his other hand. And I wonder if he can actually do it, she whispered. Jeff looked at her. You, um, think maybe he can't? She shrugs. Well, I've never seen him do it, so I don't know. Yeah. Andrew was standing apart from the group now, leafing through a large book. When he spoke, his voice rolled across the burial ground. This is the Forbidden Book. It's written by Li Yu Kang in 1905 and contains secret prayers to summon Lucifer. I'll read from it, and he will come. Never break the circle. If you break the circle, he will be drawn back to hell. Do you understand? Everyone nodded or muttered that they did. Good. Looking at the book, Andrew opened it and flipped through it. Jeff was surprised to find his chest tightening with anticipation. He stole a sidelong glance at Kayla, saw that her face was serene, and fought to push down his anxiety. All right. Silence. After a silent second, Andrew began to read. Jeff didn't recognize the language at first. It sounded like gibberish. And then he realized it was Latin. Dies serie, dies illa. Sovet seclium in favira, teste setan cum sibilla, quantos tremor est futurus, quando vindex est venturus, cuncta stricte discusurus, dies ire, dies illa. Satanas, venire, everyone replied in unison, except Jeff. Hey, um, what's he saying? He asked Kayla. Shh, Luke admonished. Andrew continued. Orient splendor, Lucis eternae, et Lucifer justitiae veni, et illumine sedentes in tenebris, et umbra mortis. Satanas, venire. Something began to happen. Jeff wasn't aware of it at first, but suddenly all at once he was. A strange, teeth chattering vibration. The fire, burning slowly, flared up now and seemed to turn blue. Jeff felt his hand going slack, but Kayla held tight. Satanas venire! Satanas venire! Satanas venire! A roar filled the night. Looking up, Jeff saw dark clouds rolling across the stars, and lightning crackled within. Dumb wonder filled him. It was happening. Andrew was actually doing it. Satanas venire. The storm opened with a crash. Lightning flashed down, and someone screamed. The world went white, and Jeff felt himself falling his hand slipping away from both Kayla and Luke. Lord, Satan, Andrew yelled. When Jeff opened his eyes, he saw Andrew on his knees. A bolt of lightning seemed to pour into him. The others also had lightning drilling in their chests. They shook and jerked like men in the electric chair. Jesus! Kayla was on the ground next to him, supported on outstretched arms. She wore an expression of horror. Another crash came and the world shook. Jeff realized that the ground was parting. Panicking, he jumped to his feet. The lightning winked out and the others collapsed. Oh, my God, 
Kayla started, but stopped. Hands were beginning to come out of the ground, clawing through the grass and dirt. A fissure had appeared lengthwise before them, and from it poured sulfurous smoke. Jeff! Jeff was so scared he couldn't move. Things were beginning to climb out of the fissure. In the orange glow coming from the hole itself, Jeff could see that they weren't human. Jeff! Kayla was tugging on his arm. The hands coming through the ground had become arms now. In a few places rotten, dead faces show through the dirt, eye sockets squirming with maggots. Jeff's paralysis broke. He turned from the horror and began to run. Part 2 Donald Graves, an accountant from Pittsburgh, on his way to a convention in Charleston, tapped the steering wheel and sang along to Billy Joel's The River of Dreams. He knew most of the words, and compensated for what he didn't by humming. It was 12.28am by the green dash clock, and Donald was starting to think about finding a motel. He told his wife, Jean, that he was just going to drive through the night, something he'd done many times before, but now, with the lines blurring on the road before him, he had to admit, he wasn't a young man anymore. He turned 50 in January, and he felt it. Donald had been following Route 228 since the crossing into Maryland at 10.30. Back there, it was wide and well lit, lined with restaurants, gas stations, and shopping malls. But here, just north of Westernport, it was narrow and dark, writhing through the woods like a snake in the throats of death. If he remembered correctly, there was a motel in Kayser. Maybe he... So quickly that Donald could barely register, something jumped out into the road and slammed into the windshield, cracking it. Screaming, he instinctively jerked the wheel to the left and slammed into the ditch, his head bouncing off the wheel. When he came to, white smoke curled from the crumpled front end of the Nissan. He moaned as a wave of agony crashed over him. Oh, Gene's gonna kill me he thought groggily. He touched his fingers to his scalp, and they came away bloody. Oh, shit. For a moment he sat where he was, hurling his mind clear. When he was sure he was steady, he pulled his cell from his pocket. Suddenly the driver door jerked open, startling him. When he saw the thing grinning at him, his blood ran cold and the phone dropped from his hand. The thing, its white face partially obscured by matted black hair, reached for him with hooked fingers, the devilish red glow of his eyes shining hypnotically. Before it caught hold of his shirt and dragged him out, he saw others behind it. A snarling, dog-faced horror with ram's horns, a decomposing woman whose skull shone eerily in the moonlight, a midget with blue skin and jagged yellow teeth. On the radio, Billy Joel searched for the Desert of Truth. In real life, Donald Graves had found it, and it was hell. Jeff stumbled, went to his knees. His side burned, and each breath was fire in his lungs. Beside him, Kayla stopped. Oh, come on! Jeff tossed a glance over his shoulder. The woods were dark and empty, and here, far from the cemetery, the only sound was the wind in the trees. Jeff! We're okay, Jeff panted. They aren't following us. Something moaned nearby, contradicting him. It sounded like it was off to the left. Jeff, come on, Kayla pled. Jeff got to his feet. Something moved between the trees. In a flash of moonlight, it looked dead. Let's go. They walked quickly through the leaves, Kayla in front and Jeff behind. He occasionally looked behind to make sure they weren't being followed. Hey, where are we going? Jeff asked at one point. The trees pressed close against them, and the underbrush was starting to get impassably thick. I don't know, she breathed. The land rose up, forming a hill, and at the summit Jeff could see the lights of town over the tops of the trees. At the bottom, on the other side of a narrow stream, a dirt road ran east to west. Jeff looked back. Faintly over the treetops, he could see the blue light. Come on, Kayla said, already starting down. Sighing, Jeff followed. At the water's edge, Kayla paused. 
How deep is it? Jeff asked. In the distance, a scream split the night, high and unearthly. Not deep enough, she said, and bounded across. Jeff stayed close behind, wincing as the icy water engulfed his feet. On the far bank, he looked back. He thought he saw something in the trees. Quick, he said, pushing Kayla forward. The road bordered the forest for several hundred yards before turning away from the stream. Trees loomed over them. At the end of the road, the trees fell away. A building with a pitched roof sat in the middle of a clearing, a gravel parking lot to one side cast in the harsh yellow glow of an arch sodium light. A church. Jeff's heart leapt. It's a church, he said. We'll be safe in there. Okay, Kayla replied. They started toward the building. Halfway there, Jeff looked back and saw with a start that over a dozen things were coming from the woods now, moving at odd angles, their heads flopping bonelessly back and forth. As he watched, something appeared on the road. Jeff couldn't tell what it was, but it loped on all fours. Oh, shit, he said. And Kayla screamed. Hurry! They ran, Kayla falling behind. Fifteen feet from the front door, Jeff stopped, grabbed her, and started dragging her. The things were closing in, twenty, twenty-five feet behind. At the door, Jeff tried the handle, but it was locked. Jeff! Jeff looked back. Three ghouls were so close, he could see the emptiness of their eye sockets. Panicking, Jeff pulled back and kicked the door as hard as he could. It flew open with a crack and slammed against the wall. Inside, just as the first zombie reached them, Jeff threw the door shut. There was a bolt that hadn't been engaged. Jeff slammed it home and backed up a step. Kayla unthinkingly grabbed him. The door shook as the things pounded against it. They couldn't come in though, right? God, they shouldn't be able to. They were demons. But what if they did? Here, Jeff said, going into the nave. Help me with one of these pews. Catching his drift, Kayla helped him drag one of the short black pews to the door. It was too long to fit lengthwise, so they pushed one end up against the door. It wasn't perfect, but it would hold. What do we do? she asked. Jeff thought, his mind worrying. He didn't know. He was just as scared as she was. A phone, she said suddenly. There has to be an office somewhere, and offices have phones. Yeah, a phone. That made sense. And they went off in search of a phone. Ray Tomlinson, Western Port's resident drunk, staggered off Maple Street and onto Main, his head throbbing and his stomach rolling. Grabbing an iron lamppost, he held on for dear life and fought back a wave of vomit. When it passed, he chuckled to himself. Ray had been drinking since he was 13, when he and a couple of his friends raided his old man's liquor cabinet. 30 years. In that time, he'd only puked three times, the last being in 1991. Ah, oh, vomit free, he thought, and smiled. He pushed himself away from the lamppost and started across the street. It was almost to the other side, when he heard something. Turning woozily, he saw a group of people walking up the middle of the street. They passed under an arch of light falling from a lamp, and even in his present state, Ray knew something wasn't right with them. They moved jerkily, some of them dragging their feet along the pavement. They didn't speak or sing or shout like a team of drunks coming home from a bar. Now they hissed, moaned, and screamed. As they drew closer, Ray's heart began to pound. Though he couldn't say why, he knew he was in danger. There's one, one of them called out, pointing. In the light, Ray could just make out his face. Drawn. Blue. A noise went through the crowd, and they started coming faster. Ray turned to run, but something hit him like a freight train, slamming him to the pavement. Just before the thing ripped out his throat, Ray saw its face. Wolf-like, elongated, its teeth crooked and yellow. And when he screamed, it came out. A bloody gurgle. From Main Street, they spread out into Western Port. 
At the corner of Maple and Oak, they pulled a man from his car and ate his skin. His screams rose into the night, reaching a fever pitch before dying down as his vocal cords slipped from his gaping neck. Lights along the street flipped on. Curtains drew back from upstairs windows. They started towards the houses then, pounding on front doors and smashing through windows. In one house, a man appeared at the top of the stairs with a pistol and fired. Only then did he realize what he was facing. The bullets had no effect. On Staples Drive, they dragged a screaming infant from its crib and feasted on it as its shrieking mother watched in horror. When her mind snapped and she sank into catatonia, one of them, a rapist in life, ripped her pink bathrobe off of her and took her. On Bower Road, Sheriff Bill Wyatt jerked the wheel of his squad car and skidded across the pavement, the car doing a half circle before stopping. Next to him, his deputy, Roger Yancey, wore an expression of horror. The street was filled with them, some wandering aimlessly, others bending over fallen bodies. Jesus, fuck, Wyatt said, unclasping his safety belt and grabbing the shotgun from its place between the seats. He flung the door open and got out into the bitter night. Several of them saw him and started coming forward, their hands outstretched. Skin! Wyatt pumped the shotgun and raised it to his shoulder. Hey, freeze! Yancey was crouching behind his door, his pistol in his hands. The things continued advancing. When the first calls came through, Wyatt didn't know what to think. People running amok in Westernport. Why? This wasn't Ferguson. Then, when more calls came in from hysterical people reporting monsters, he knew something was seriously wrong. Monsters, mass hysteria, crooks dressed as monsters, well, who knew? Now, watching the creatures shambling down the street, Wyatt saw that they were monsters. Men with the heads of dogs, crawling horrors with upside-down skulls, fangs, horns, more skulls, all bathed in throbbing red and blue lights from the cruiser's roof rack. Shivering, saying a silent prayer to a god he hadn't spoken to in twenty years, Wyatt aimed at the closest monster, a rotting corpse in a tattered burial gown, and fired, the recoil of the shotgun nearly knocking him down. He wasn't steady. The thing turned and fell. Wyatt pumped the shotgun again and swung it around, taking aim at a seven-foot-tall giant with red skin and horns. Is it Satan himself? Yancey was firing now, too, his gun going pop, like small-scale fireworks. Wyatt fired, but the monster took the buckshot like it was a warm summer wind. Oh, shit. He pumped the shotgun again, sending the empty shell to the pavement, and aimed higher, hitting it in the head. Nothing. Bill, Yancey said, his voice full of fear. Hold steady. Giving up on the devil, Wyatt fired at another corpse. This one went down, but got right back up. They were so close he could smell them. Oh, sulfur, rotten eggs. Wyatt caught the gun again, but it was empty. They'd be on him before he could load it again. Run! He turned, but a black shape with large, ragged eyes rushed him. For a moment he felt cold, then he felt himself changing. The world went grey, then black. The sound of Roger Yancey's screams as the things took him was muffled, distant. His mind tingled. God, I'm being possessed. Well, that's the last Bill Wyatt knew. His body, now cold to the touch, joined the creatures feasting on Roger Yancey's insides. At 2.30am, nearly two dozen creatures attacked the Western Port Sewage Treatment Facility, killing a night watchman and several third shift technicians. One of the things, a hulking bat-like horror, laughingly pulled levers and pushed buttons, sending a tidal wave of waste spilling into the Potomac. Up and down Main Street, they convorted with satanic glee, smashing windows, starting fires, and killing anyone they could find. By 3 a.m., Western Port was silent, fires raging unchecked. In search of blood, many started to crawl toward McCool. Some crossed the Potomac into West Virginia. At 3.25, they attacked a homeless camp by the railroad track. At 3.38, a dozen, including many former Westernport residents, reached McCool. A 
collection of buildings around the foot of a bridge rather than an actual town. They raided houses, stopped cars and marched into Kiza. Their first victim was a Potomac State College student on a late night walk. Following Front Street through the downtown business section, he had a strange laughter several times before something swooped him and grabbed him from the air. Talons dug into his flesh. He screamed and the thing, coring like the world's largest crow, lifted him higher and higher before dropping him. The last thing that went through his mind, other than the pavement, was... Fuck. At 401, Brian Scott, night watchman at Potomac Valley Hospital, looked up from his magazine, a strange feeling suddenly coming over him. The emergency room was empty and tranquil at that hour, the fluorescent lighting harsh and cold. Shaking his head, Bryant went back to his magazine, an interview with Hillary Clinton. Ah, that fucking crook. The automatic doors whooshed open then, and Bryant looked up. Five things stood before them. Their faces, Brian saw with a jerk, were varying shades of blue and grey, and their clothing hung from their emaciated bodies in tatters. Fools, one of them screamed, and they came toward him. Heart knocking against his ribcage, Brian moved to stand up, but another unseen creature grabbed him from behind, wrestling him to the ground. When Brian Scott was dead, the ghouls split up, two going down separate corridors and one descending a flight of stairs to the morgue where it found a stash of cold bodies and began to feast. In room 2A, Elvira Johnson, an elderly widow lost in the grip of dementia, watched with dumb blankness as one of the monsters shuffled to her bedside. She was far too gone to know what was happening, but not too far gone to scream. Two miles away, Josh Simmons, 15, woke to the sound of something tapping at his window. The sound was frightening in the dark. What made it even more frightening was that Josh's room was on the second floor. Hey, he whispered to his roommate Matt. Well, Matt snorted. Josh tried to ignore the constant tap, 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 but he couldn't. Finally, he got up, went to the window and opened the curtain. Nothing. Opening the window, Josh stuck his head out into the night and looked around. Nah, it was windy, so maybe... Then a cloud of acrid smoke washed over him, and suddenly he was cold. Possessed, he smiled. First he beat Matt to death with his fists, then he went out into the hall and listened. Group home, the boy's mind said. Two boys in each room, two staff members downstairs. Creeping as silently as he could, he went down the back stairs into the darkened kitchen. A light glowed in the living room. On the TV, sirens wailed. From a drawer, the boy selected a butcher knife and went back upstairs. He stabbed each of the remaining four residents, panting with pleasure. When he was done, he went downstairs and found a black man lounging on the couch. Yeah, what you doing? The black man asked. Killing people. The man tried to fight, but he wound up just like all the others. At 5am, one of the creatures stumbled into the path of a semi screaming down US-50 north of Burlington, but south of Kazan. Hanging on for dear life, it made it all the way to Romney before letting go. There, it caught a stray cat and ate it. Back in Kazan, things ran rampant through the streets, much as they'd done in Westernport. Within half an hour, they'd reached New Creek in West Virginia, and Barton, Dawson, and Moscow in Maryland. The night was theirs. Jeff Morgan jerked awake just as the first light of dawn fell through the window. Kayla was next to him, her head lolling on his shoulder. She was asleep. For a moment, Jeff listened to the silence of the morning. God, was it really dawn? The night had seemed to stretch forever. The things pounded on the door and appeared at the windows, including Andrew and the others, their faces pale and their eyes black. Come on, Andrew said at one point, smiling. The power of Satan. They never came through the doors or windows, even though they could have easily done. Jeff suspected they were afraid of the church, or the spirit of God. Wake up, he said, shaking Kayla. Are they here? 
They found a phone in the back office and called the police. They never showed, though. No, he said, but I think it's over. Listen. Kayla cocked her head and did. Hey, come on. They moved the pew and opened the door. The morning was cold and orange and fresh. The field fronting the church was empty. The woods beyond, still cast in shadows, could have hidden demons, but he doubted they did. Probably couldn't come out in the daylight. An hour later, when the sun was fully risen, they left, Jeff in the lead. Where are we going? Kayla asked. Jeff didn't reply, but he had an idea. Back at the cemetery, the ground was still wide open, but no bodies were visible. No signs, nothing. The only thing they found was the book Andrew had read from, cracked brown leather. Jeff picked it up. Hey, what are you doing? Kayla asked. Oh, you'll see. They walked back to the church. Birds chirped happily from treetops. At the church, Jeff opened the door and threw the book inside. It burst into flames. Well, um, I think it was a doorway, he said to her then. And that's how they came out. Kayla didn't reply. They simply watched the book burning on the floor of the church. Let's go, she said finally. So hand in hand, they walk back into Western Port. Every day, I tell myself that I'm going to stop drinking. Yet every day I find myself picking up the glass once more. It's a good thing that I don't drink that much daily. I know my liver will probably fall apart by the time I reach my 60s, but... I've yet to come across a better way to calm the storm that has been raging inside my mind ever since I met him. Back in 2013, I requested my leave from the Syrian observation mission. At that point, I'd grown tired from seeing all the pointless bloodshed that was going on there. I'd been a soldier pretty much my whole adult life up to that point, and being so powerless was probably just a tad too much for me. Once I was granted my release, I decided to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. It was a lovely trip, all in all. One evening, I decided to clear my head at a local bar. I was sitting there, completely zoned out as some silly club music blared through the speakers. My head was in the clouds, or well, that is, until a gruff voice snapped me back into reality. What does a United Nations soldier do in such a place? My mind snapped back into fight mode as my head snapped sharply to my left. A bearded man was sitting next to me. He was visibly a few inches taller than me, and his smug expression made me a little uneasy. Not to mention the fact that he wasn't supposed to know my profession, or so I thought back then. How? I was cut off short. How do you know, you'd like to ask? He retorted, as a wide smile formed on his face. A knot began forming inside my stomach. I almost felt sick with the build-up of dread. I began clenching my fists, a million thoughts whirling in my mind. I couldn't fathom at the time the existence of this person. <laughs> The Lord of Flyers knows many a thing. He chuckled at me, further adding to my nervousness. I was about to explode at him and demand answers in regard to his strange behavior and impossible knowledge. However, the man reached into the pocket of his coat and pulled out some old coin. He proceeded to toss it into the air as my eyes followed every single movement of his. As the coin spun through the air, it started slowing down mid-flight, and everything around me, oh, well, the music stopped playing, the lights above had stopped moving, and the coin froze in the air. This sight made my heart sink. My fear was probably evident, as the man was trying hard not to burst into laughter. 
None of this made any sense to me back then. All I could muster was a soft, unconfident... What? Time stood still around me, quite literally. Everything was simply frozen in time. I didn't know how to react. I didn't know what to think. I couldn't move, as the whole situation was too hard to process. The man reached out his hand to me, offering a handshake. <sighs> Beelzebub. My pleasure, Daniel. <laughs> I couldn't speak. I felt sick. This was too much for me to handle, and I threw up on the floor. My head was spinning, and my heart raced. I felt awful. There was no mistaking it. I'd been approached by some sort of, well, something supernatural. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to know my name. I wiped my face and looked at the man whom I assumed was the devil at that point. He'd lowered his arm and took a sip of his beer. Mm, I know, it's quite shocking all of this. Well, it's not my first rodeo with you humans. Not wanting to piss off someone who could stop time and probably knew more about me than, well, I wanted anyone to, I cautiously asked him, Are you the devil? The man burst out into a maddening laughter, which had somewhat put me at ease. <laughs> oh, father, this joke again, he mused to himself, as some beer had spilled on his coat, clearly amused by my lack of awareness towards higher beings such as himself. <laughs> no, no, I'm not the devil. It's a common misconception, however, he proceeded to note. You see, angels, demons, whatever, we're all the same kind. There was no big fight, or even a divide between us. There's not much of a hierarchy or rule set between us. We are truly equal to one another. Everything you know about us is human fiction. He continued speaking. Every time Father tried speaking to you humans, well, you go mad. I guess you're still not at a high enough level to communicate with the old man. This made very little sense to me, as it was the opposite from what I'd been taught my whole life. I wasn't sure if I should believe this person or not. After all, he was claiming to be a demon. I guess he'd noticed the doubt written all over my face, as he made a snarky remark towards me. <sighs> if I was lying... Wouldn't I be tempting you with something right now? You know, the Prince of Gluttony, yada, yada, yada. No, I just... Yeah, I get it, Daniel. You've been indoctrinated to believe in some weird anthropocentric story. Mind you, that well, there are millions, perhaps even billions of species who are even more intelligent than your kind. To be honest... I'm pretty certain there are beings who are more advanced than my father, somewhere out there. There are probably beings higher than God. I had nothing to say. I was completely shocked by this revelation. While on the one hand, the things he was saying were making sense. On the other hand, they weren't making any sense at all. So... How does this whole cosmic order thing work, then? I asked, weakly. Mm, well, anything with a consciousness mechanism has what you define as a soul. It includes me, you, everything else on this planet with a complex neural system. Even Father has that sort of thing. Now, nothing is really eternal. Eventually, everything dies. At one point, every sentient being will pass away, he answered. Even God? I was unsure if I even wanted to hear the answer to that question, and yet I asked anyway. Yeah, someday in the future. 
You are aware of the fact that he isn't all creator of everything. As obvious as this should have been at that point, this sentence sent chills down my spine. I sank deeper into my chair. Hmm. Here's the kicker, though. The one thing you humans got right, well, in a way. Hell is real. The circumstances around it are what you got wrong, though. What do you mean? Don't the wicked go there? I asked him in response. No, not the wicked, but the guilty, he proclaimed as he hoisted his cup of beer into the air. The guilty? I asked, puzzled. Yeah. If you die feeling guilt over something, it turns into a negative energy and your consciousness goes to this dimension where it has to rid itself of said guilt. It has to be a major thing, though. If you feel guilty for something extremely minor, you're most likely to just dissipate into the universe. Once he'd finished speaking about the inner workings of the universe, I looked directly into his green eyes and asked, with as much confidence as I could muster. So, why are you telling me all of this? He smiled that unsettling smile once again. It's because I need your opinion on something, Daniel. Let's have a walk, shall we? He got up from his chair and began walking towards the entrance of the bar. At first I was hesitant to do anything, and I watched him walk for a few moments before I heard him call out to me. Not wanting to piss off a thing that could stop time, and probably murder me on a whim, I got up to my feet, ignoring the dried puke on my shoes, and started catching up with the man. Once I reached him, he was at the bar's entrance, pressing his hand against the door. As the door swung open, a bright light engulfed me, blinding me for a moment. It felt as if a flash grenade was thrown straight at me. The light was so bright it almost hurt. After an agonizing few seconds, the light began dispersing, and a familiar sight greeted my eyes. Oh, no way, I blurted under my breath. We are in Syria, next to some rebel encampment, Beelzebub announced, almost gleefully. I looked around, the bar building was right behind me. However, it was surrounded by nearly endless sands of the Syrian desert. I'd been in this place before. There was no mistaking it, this was the Syrian desert. As I was trying to process whatever was going on around me, Beelzebub asked me, Tell me, Daniel, do you believe that all humans deserve to live? He caught me off guard, but this was probably the easiest answer I'd had to give that day. Yes, I do, I answered, still eyeing my surroundings. <laughs> Even the sadistic band of serial murder rapists in this encampment before us? He asked again, pointing at the makeshift paramilitary compound. Yes, even them. If what you say about them is true, they should be detained and tried, but they do deserve to live. Killing them won't make it any better. It was still an easy question. I don't believe killing will ever salvage anything. I doubt the death penalty is a good way to rid ourselves of crime, even to this day. Hmm, I see. Well, follow me. I need to show you something that might change your mind. Beelzebub began walking towards the bar building once more, pushing the door open again. I stumbled across the sands after him. The alcohol I'd consumed earlier was starting to take effect again. A bright light blinded me, followed by a freezing breeze that sent chills throughout my whole body. Once I'd regained my sight, I found myself standing at the beginning of a large stone bridge above a dark, deep pit. The longer I stared out, the more I came to realize that I couldn't see the bottom of this hole. 
the dread started eating at me once more, when another gust of freezing wind hit my body. Soon after, I began hearing screaming coming from up above me. I turned my head upwards ever so slightly to see a human body, a naked human body falling towards me from up above. This body was alive. I could tell so as it was flailing its limbs about, the body screams growing louder with each passing moment. When the body was mere inches from me, I saw its face. Oh, God, its face. The despair was permanently etched onto its features. There was a fearful stare in its glaring eyes. The cheek's muscles were stretched beyond what I thought was possible due to the constant screaming. Drool and tears flew all over. I know that we shared eye contact for the briefest of moments, but I've never seen someone in so much pain before. Is this hell? I mumbled as the body flew past me into the seemingly never-ending darkness below. Yeah. Beelzebub noted, with a smile stretching from ear to ear. He seemed to be almost glowing in that godforsaken place. Long after the body flew past me, I could still hear its constant screaming. It kept on ringing in my ears for a long time after I'd left that cursed abyss. Beelzebub led me on atop the stone bridge for quite some time. And the longer I walked on this bridge, the more I wanted out of there. These bodies, they kept on falling all over. Oh, God. Some hit the bridge. Massive blood stains. They kept on falling. They just slipped downwards, back into the bottomless moor of their abandon. Oh, oh, sorry, I, it's just, it's hard bringing this up in detail again, even though it never leaves me, even though it haunts me in my dreams. After some walking, Beelzebub stopped me and asked me to look down to my left. When I looked, I saw a piece of rock protruding from the darkness itself. On top of the rock, there was a sea of people walking one after another in circles. In an unbreakable harmony, they marched forever, one after the other. Each step seemed more fatigued than the one before. Meowzebub told me that those were the people who died harboring the guilt of following a bad leader. These were Nazi soldiers, terrorists, Mob soldiers, all sorts of weak-minded individuals who knew they were following the wrong leader and still went on with it. Beelzebub even called them pathetic for harboring such a guilt, noting that these were his least favorite kind of hell spawns. I felt bad for them. I do understand their guilt. The reasons I left my active service in Syria because of my powerless brought upon me a set of regulations that do not strive to prevent as much suffering as possible. I hated that feeling. I hated feeling powerless. And yet, look at me now. I'm powerless more than ever before. We kept on walking across the stone bridge for some more time before a rancid stench filled my nostrils. Beelzebub told me to look to my right. There was another protrusion made of stone peeking through the darkness. On top of the protrusion, there was a pile of a dark substance made of what smelled like feces. I had a hard time looking at that direction as the stench was way too vile for me. Beelzebub, on the other hand, was enjoying the view of a human pull himself out of the pile, only to be sunk back down into it by another human's arms as the latter tried to pull himself out as well, only to suffer the same fate at the hands of another. Can we leave? It stinks so bad. 
I cried out from underneath my shirt covered mouth. Beelzebub just grunted in approval and led me on across the bridge of stone. Soon enough, we were standing at the edge of a forked path. One diversion was made up of stone, another of some pulsating fleshy mass, and another was made up of sand. Beelzebub led me onto the path of sand. I'd like you to meet someone, Daniel. Someone very important. He's been here for nearly two millennia, Beelzebub remarked, with some glee in his tone. Two thousand years, I muttered. I couldn't even bear staying another hour in this place, and yet someone had been there for two thousand years. Beelzebub did not speak for a while as he walked on the sandy path. I grew more and more anxious with each moment to the point of trembling. My mind was racing. My breathing was quick and shallow. I'm sorry. I can't. I need to relax just for a moment. Eventually, we reached a large sand dune. It was the biggest sand dune I'd ever seen. It was so massive it towered above everything else in sight. A literal sand giant in the middle of a world made out of pure darkness. I'd like you to meet Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus Germanicus, announced Beelzebub in a gleeful tone. A young, tall and skinny man dressed in a bloody tunic strutted out of the sand dune. He had a very fixated, cold stare in his eyes. It's like... He was bulging his pupils out at us. The man just stared for a minute or so. The surrounding atmosphere was so tense you could have cut it in half. He shrieked like a wounded animal and fell onto the sand screaming obscenities at the old Roman deities and the Senate. He then began shrieking about how he should be the god of this world, the god of all worlds from the Capitoline Hill down to the depths of Tartarus. He began rolling around in the sand, screaming at the top of his lungs that he is the emperor god of all, and that he should have made them hear him more. He then proceeded to shove sand down his own throat, first with his hands, and then he just fell to the ground and started swallowing the sound beneath him with his mouth. He wouldn't stop that for quite a while, not even when it was clear he was choking on the sand. I swear I could see some sand pouring down from his nasal cavity. The man was a complete wreck. At some point his stomach could not contain any more of the substance, and he threw it all up, producing vile choking sounds as he did. He then started rolling in his own vomit, shrieking about fear and control. And no matter how long he rolled in the sand, he kept his stare fixated on me. There was something really unnerving about his almost fish-like hazel eyes being locked onto me. He began screaming obscenities again as he ran to the top of the dune while I watched in pity as he hurled himself down its sands. His body rolled around in the sand like a ragdoll being tossed about. I could hear the sickening, crackling sounds of his bones echo throughout the space as his body was being folded in unnatural angles by his own momentum. Eventually, his broken body landed at my feet. The body lay there as his limbs were folded awkwardly. His body was positioned on its belly with the head turned 180 degrees. And those god damn fish eyes were still staring straight at me. I felt a knot build up in my stomach again. I was sure I'd throw up again. I could literally feel the food rising up my esophagus. Bow to your god, the body whispered. It startled me. A moment later, I found myself sitting back at the bar next to Beelzebub, shaking with fear as my mind was racing. 
Nothing made any sense to me anymore. Nothing at all. I looked at Beelzebub, and the back of my head began throbbing as I was hit with a hammer across the skull. My vision started blurring, and my ears began to ring. I, I, I don't... I managed to blurt out as I was trying to fight through my sudden headache. So, did your meeting with Little Sandals make you change your mind about the value of all human lives? Beelzebub asked. I don't... don't know. I forced myself to respond weakly, as my head felt as if it was about to blow up. Beelzebub drank up all his remaining beer and said, Well, that's a shame, because I already slaughtered that whole Syrian encampment. As he said that, the pain in my head began subsiding and disturbing images began popping up in my mind. I've seen it. I've seen it all. The way he tore them apart. The way he ripped them to shreds. I felt the tears. I felt the tears streaming down my own cheeks just like they do now as I write this. I can't get the image of him making a gun sign with his fingers, shoving it down a kneeling man's mouth and blowing up his skull. Oh, God. Beelzebub was gone after that. I heard that damn coin fall onto the wood. I placed my head in my arms and began crying. I couldn't stop. I still can't. I can't. He was gone, but the guilt, it's there. It's all my fault. All of this is my fault. It's my fault I followed him there. Everything is my fault. Please, pardon me. I'm just a sorrowful drunk with a lot on his plate. I know now that the devil does not bargain for souls. He simply guilts their owners straight to hell, where he can watch them suffer for as long as he wants them to. Well, I'll drink to the craftiness of this son of a gun. Cheers. So yes, hell, the devil, demons, all that kind of thing, it's one of those forever topics which never gets old and is always popular on the channel, so hope you enjoyed those two stories this evening. Yep, yeah, like I said, um, everyone and his cat and his dog all do with some kind of video on Halloween, so I just sort of bowed out for a night and thought I'd just wait until now. So <laughs> here I am, the day after Halloween. Um, there was a podcast last night, of course, um, which I did pretty much, well, I compiled every werewolf story I've ever done, I think. It was about four hours long. So if you haven't listened to that, it's still there. <laughs> it's going to be there forever. So, yeah, there you go. Go away and enjoy that one as well. Now, um, what day is it? It's Tuesday. Well, I'm a, a bit of a, I'm all off schedule, aren't I? So when am I going to be back? Um, I don't know. Thursday or Friday? Uh going for the longer stories from now on, or compilation videos, so uh, everything's going to be more than an hour long, just to keep you busy, and for those of you that like to sleep through these, <laughs> then they're just for you, I guess, as well. Well enough for me for one evening. Back again very soon. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.